Hey there, my gorgeous friends on the internet. In the last couple of years, PostgreSQL has started to become more and more one of my favorite pieces of technologies out there. First of all, it's open source, which is amazing, and it's been out there since the bloody 80s. So it's really mature, highly scalable, and reliable, offers some really nice features that you might not find somewhere else, like full text search, JSONB support, and generally speaking, the ecosystem around it is becoming more and more exciting to be in and more popular as well. If you've seen the super base select event, that, that just happened a couple of days ago, they basically announced VTest for Postgres. And that's really exciting because they do smart routing now, sharding and replication. But I wanted to make a video explaining kind of all these different concepts that you should be aware about when it comes to databases. So we're going to cover all of these from indexes, what pooling does, sharding. It's going to be an exciting one. So let's get going. One of the first concepts you should be aware of when it comes to Postgres is the ability to index something. What that means is, let's say your application grew up to 100,000 users, which is pretty crazy. Pat yourself on the back. That's my chest. Uh, but basically, you'd have a user stable somewhere in your database, and each row would hold all the information about one specific user. So you'd have 100,000 of these rows. So if I want to query maybe a user based on their email address, I'd write a query something like select star from users, where email equals uh, edwin at gmail.com, for example. The database would have to do a full table scan. So it would go row by row until it finds that specific email and then it would return it to me. So as you can imagine, this can be quite slow. Uh, as soon as you have more users, right? There's more stuff to scan. It's pretty much like going through a book and scanning each page until you find the specific information you want. That's why we have indexes besides these tables. So this is held in a whole different data structure called a B tree. And this holds all the indexes that are essentially sorted key values that act as a pointer back to that specific table row. So again, same as in a book where it tells you that on page 20, you're going to find information about something specific. So you can go directly there without doing a full scan of each individual page. Now, what are the downsides of this? Yes, this can give you a faster query time. However, this still needs to be stored on disk. So all of these key values with their pointers are also saved and consume disk space. Okay, let's see how we can create an index. So first of all, I just have an empty database here and I'll create a table called users. And this is just going to have an ID and a name on it. Okay, so let's hit enter. That created the table. If I do a select everything, which is star from users, there it is. So zero rows, we just have an ID and a name. So I'm going to run this little thing here that essentially is going to generate us uh, like 10,000 different records. So insert into users in the name and I'll pass in user and generate series here. I won't do a million. I'll just do 10,000 for now so we can kind of analyze the query time. So let's do that. That added 10,000 users. So if I reselect this again, look at that. We have a bunch of different rows. Okay, so let's say we want to select maybe user number 7,500, and we can see how long that takes. So we can run something called explain and analyze to get that back. So let's run that. And again, I'll just pass in a lower number here, not a million, so let's do 7,500. Now, if I run this a couple times, as you can see, you have the planning and execution time. So it's still relatively like really fast. Okay. This is more if you have a more complex uh, query and the data is a tad bit bigger than that. But there we go. So let's see how we can actually create a uh, index. So to do that, we will run this create index and then we can give it a name. So I'll call it index user's name and I'll run it on the user's name. There we go. So that created the index. And now if we run the same query again, let's do 9,000. As you can see, the execution time went way down. So we have 0 0.7 here and here we have 0 0.02 now. So as you can see, no matter how much I run that, I can change this as well. This is now on disk and it's going to go for this before it actually does a full table scan. Let's talk about sharding and replication and how do those come into play? Because why wouldn't I simply YOLO and buy my own uh, like VPS somewhere and host my own uh, Postgres instance, let's say in North Virginia, which is essentially just a server, right? I'm buying a server that has maybe 80 gigabytes of uh, disk space, maybe two gigabytes of memory and some CPU. So I can run my Postgres there and everything's fine, right? Fine and dandy. Well, the problems that you might run into is 
what happens again if you get more and more users and you have more and more data that lives in that database the 80 gigabytes is going to get consumed and then you're kind of stuck right so you'd have to upgrade and move to a bigger storage so that would mean that you'd actually have to take your instance down and you'd have basically downtime, which is no bueno. And you'd have to migrate that data over to your new instance that supports maybe 200 gigabytes of space now. Uh, so we're still not solving uh, kind of the, the spacing issue. And also again, remember how I said that once you have more and more data and more and more rows, the query times can also slow down. Well, that's where sharding comes into play. It essentially breaks your database into smaller chunks right into smaller databases now that could be based on region as well so it could save maybe european users in a european shard and us users in a us shard it can also break it down even further so your users maybe in one shard are saved from a to m right from their names to a to m and then the rest from m to z so you'd have two pieces again which would again improve a lot of that query speed but also kind of solve the problem of just having this one gigantic database that just grows and grows and grows and that's why i'm really excited about uh, superbase select where they announced the multigress where they have all of this built in for you all the sharding now is supported where you can spin up multiple instances and it is also all handled for you okay the baby just threw up on my sweater so i had to change it life is good uh, but let's talk about foreign keys this is one of those concepts that you're going to be using all the time when it comes to relations databases so it's essentially a key that enforces relationships between two tables and it also keeps your data consistent so let's say we have two tables we have a users table that just holds all of our users in each individual row and then we have an orders table that we want each order to essentially belong to one user right we kind of have an order that doesn't have a user so we'd have a column in there in the orders table that's called something like user id and we can mark that as a foreign key and that's going to reference the user id from the users table and that's why when you try to create an order and the user doesn't exist postgres will automatically reject that for you this is what's called referential integrity postgres will not allow to execute that operation because it breaks the constraints of the relationship between the two tables now what happens when we delete the user right because those orders are connected to that specific user so this is when you might have heard of terms like on cascade delete or on cascade update these things just make sure that everything stays consistent and nothing is out of sync so in case we run something like on cascade delete if we delete the user all the relevant orders that are connected to that specific user also get deleted right so it's all about keeping everything synchronized okay let's see how we can create a foreign key so i'll create a table here it's going to be called users so create table users we have an id and a name so super simple there we go that's been created and i'll create an order table as well where we want to have that foreign key and here it is a user id column and we need to add this references keyword and then we say users id so that's what it references and then our action that we want to do so on delete cascade we'll delete all of these uh, order columns when that specific user also gets deleted so there we go we created and that's our foreign key set up so I just inserted into users here one value with the name of max. As you can see, it inserted it. So if I do select star from users, we should add back that user with an ID of one, as you can see there. So now if I do an insert into, I want to do it in the order stable. So I'll say orders. I can pass down the user ID here and the product. Okay, so I'll just do values here. And the ID for max here is one. So I'll just pass that value down and then coffee here for the second value. Let's hit enter. As you can see, that got inserted. However, if I try to pass this down into an ID that doesn't exist, so like 999, as you can see, we get that uh, violate foreign key constraint problem. And this is exactly what we want. It stops us from creating records that don't have that uh, integrity shared. 
Now, what about replication? It essentially means that you are taking the same data and duplicating it across different instances, uh, which really helps with availability. So you typically have one database and maybe two, three replicas that are in different parts of the world. So what this means is that if one goes down, the user, when he queries some data, can be rerouted over to another one, uh, which is really great, right? In the case where we just had a VPS, running our Postgres instance, if your VPS goes down, you're screwed. Your whole service is unavailable. This can also help with query speeds, right? If I'm in Europe and I do a query, I should be able to hit that replica that's closer to me rather than going all the way over to the primary database that could live in uh, Virginia, for example. And this is why it's so exciting to be a super base uh, user right now, because Multigress provides all of this for you, the sharding and the replication. And they also do the smart routing as well, where it figures out where the closer replica is to you to give you really nice speeds. And that is automatically done for you. And they also have a system where if I do a write, so the write usually happens on the primary database, it synchronizes with the replicas so they keep the same data up to date. So super, super sick. I highly recommend it. I'll, I'll link Multigress down in the description below for you to check it out. Definitely have a look. Another really important feature that you should be aware of is transactions. I see some people don't use this and you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. Okay. It essentially allows you to take multiple different SQL operations and group them together in a single unit. And this is really important to keep the data integrity because God forbid, maybe two of those operations go through and the last one doesn't. And then you have this problem of desyncing and you can imagine where you might need to update maybe you know a user has purchased a product and you might need to do three different operations maybe uh, subtract the credit from the user table you might need to update the orders table right so these are two operations if one of them doesn't go through but the other one does because i don't know network issues or whatever this causes a really big problem let's talk about pooling and how this comes into play so when i'm requesting some data from my application Postgres essentially is making a connection with me that uses a certain amount of CPU and memory, right? Until it handles that query. And you can imagine that if you have a lot of different requests coming in, requesting data, Postgres has to open a connection for all of those individual users. Now, if you have a massive influx of this, it can really, really slow down the server, potentially even crashing your Postgres instance. And this is where something like PG Bouncer comes into play. It's essentially a connection pool that allows you to keep a set of connections already open and ready to use. So when these requests come in now, they can just use that open connection. And when they leave, another request can also reuse that connection. So there's not a lot of this opening and closing that could potentially make the system unreliable and potentially cause crashes. Everything can just reuse that connection. And this also helps with query speeds because opening them also takes a certain amount of time. So there we go. Those are some of the really important concepts that you should be aware of when it comes to PostgreSQL. This is why I kind of generally tend people to say use a service, something like Supabase rather than hosting it on your own VPS, because you might run into instances that you might have not thought of, you know, God forbid your uh, whole VPS falls down, crashes, and then your whole service is unavailable. So services again, like Supabase provides stuff like high uh, availability and failover. So in case your primary goes down, it can automatically route it to a replica and then nothing goes offline. Also like backups and stuff. Yeah, you can do it yourself, but I never want to live with that stress of my VPS getting hacked or something and I lose that data backup as well. So being able to have features like uh, jumping a, a specific point in time, like yesterday, five o'clock, I want to go to that specific date and see how it looked and I can revert back to it or just like really nice features that these services can provide. So I wouldn't really mess around with that too much. Uh, with other stuff, yeah, sure. Like if you wanted your analytics or something like that, you want to host it on your own VPS. I actually do that myself. So uh, that's something that you should keep in mind. Okay, that's going to be it for me. Let me know if I missed anything down in the comments below. I'll love to make another episode on it and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.